call black everything Everything black, culture over everything Y'all, we taking it back, black Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We are joined today by two historians. Jessica Marie Johnson, an assistant professor of history at Michigan State University. And also Treva Blaine Lindsay, assistant professor of women and gender studies at The Ohio State University. How are you doing today, professors? Doing well. <laughs> uh, I wanted to have you on to talk about this really provocative uh, essay that the two of you co-wrote for the Journal Meridians, uh, which is a very well-known uh, feminist uh, journal, titled the piece is Searching for Climax, Black Erotic Lives and Slavery and Freedom. Um, in some ways, very, very new fertile territory um, for historians, uh, centering obviously black women's lives um, as itself the site for the production of knowledge but in this case, black women's sexual lives and erotic lives as a site uh, to think productively about the lives of black women. Uh, talk about how this piece came together, Professor Lindsay. Sure. So I was offered the opportunity as people were really considering the Harriet Tubman sex tape that mm -hmm. was released uh, via Russell Simmons' digital channel, which having all this content. and. We noticed the reactions to it were very strong, very critical uh, initially. And although I think a lot of the pieces that came out about it, which some of them are actually in the special issue as well, were rightfully um, indignant about yeah. what we were seeing and the ways in which Harriet Tubman was portrayed and depicted and using this moment to think comically in certain ways about black sexual violence. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that there was something else that was missing in the conversation and how we begin to think about the sexual lives of black women historically and contemporarily. And both Dr. Johnson and I have been thinking about doing some work together around this because we enter this really at two different points, both as mm -hmm. historians, but with Dr. Johnson specializing in thinking about this kind of early modern period, thinking about slavery and free women of color and their lives, me coming in in the post-emancipation moment, but also thinking about some of these questions that are coming out around erotics, pleasure, desire, and thinking about doing a collaborative piece to really get at this, to get at this as both historians, as people interested in cultural studies, mm -hmm. as people deeply engaged in interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approaches to this, and also the overarching framework, I think, of black interiority and particularly black women's interiority, which I think the erotics becomes one way of mapping what that may look like and our discomfort with thinking about the erotics mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. an interior space that warrants our excavation. It's Harriet Tubman, <laughs> Professor Johnson. It's Harriet Tubman. Um, there are folks who obviously, in response, obviously to the Russell Simmons video, but even that folks would choose to, when looking at who Harriet Tubman is, to look at this other aspect of her life, um, you know, what do you do with those folks who are like, we don't need to know that information, <laughs> right? We, we don't need to know, right? We've already had this great idea of who this woman was and, and the role that she played in our liberation struggle. Why do we need to know this backstory? Well, one of the things that we wanted to sort of address um, is this question of what is sort of an erotic life during a period of slavery. Can we view that in a resistive way? Can we use it as a space for a different kind of liberatory politics? Because one of the things about Tubman, um, which had people in such an outrage, uh, is that she is this iconic figure. Um, and yet in being an iconic figure, we've had to strip away certain aspects of her um, humanity. Um, and that's a problematic term, but I, mean, I think it can be useful here. Um, we have to have, we've made her Moses, we've made her androgynous in some really interesting ways. Yeah. Um, she cer we certainly um, inevitably forget that she was married twice. She was married to a man who was half her age and the later part of her life. Yes. You know, like there are all these aspects of her life that are domestic, they're about family, but they're also about sex and intimacy um, that we set aside in order to make her liberatory. And I think what's interesting about 
sort of approaching it in the figure of Tubman, who is so iconic, is that if we recover those pieces, what then does that say about the kind of spaces of um, the new liberatory politics that we can engage in? Um, what other aspects of um, black humanity or black womanhood, um, um, what black queer stories can then come out if we approach black lives from this, um, from this perspective? Uh, it expands politics, I think. Yes. I know for some people it was very scary, <laughs> or it can seem very scary, it can take some people aback, and I think that that's fine, but I also think that there's ways that, and I also think there was something really productive. Um, I think we both yeah, thought there was something really very productive about her being an iconic figure um, for what she was. But it, it seems like this is a good moment to begin to ask different questions and to press beyond that. Because the iconic figures that we have, or at least the ways that we've shaped them, um, are not moving us forward into the moment in which um, in which we are approaching new challenges, um, which you know, we, we know everything that's happening in the street right now. So. I think we need to have new, ask new questions in order to get new politics, new strategies to, to approach these things. Besides the Russell Simmons video, I mean, this, this also comes up in the opening scenes of 12 Years a Slave, mm -hmm. um, uh, where there is a, a female character who clearly is desiring some moment of pleasure. Um, and and it, in the context of the film, really, it, it really strikes you as, as a mode of resistance, actually, right? To be able to feel herself, if you will. Um, and a lot of folks were kind of put off by that. Um, you know, the, the, the easy way to describe it, well, that's what a British film director would do, a black British film director would do to an American story, right? He doesn't really get it. I mean, all these other kinds of narratives, you know, including the fact that the thought that it was just gratuitous, you know, in that scene. Um, but part of what your research talks about is the fact that, you know, these are folks who have real lives, who have real desires, in which their full humanity is also about you know, sexual desire and, and eroticism. Um, how do you balance this historical narrative with the way that folks often police black female erotic lives in the contemporary moment? That's, that's a very difficult question. <laughs> but I think for us, we considered some of this work, we considered a, an erotic mapping mm -hmm. of doing a certain kind of work. And we're doing that increasingly in a contemporary context. but. We have to understand the intentionality behind how we think about and how we study certain periods in history, which we do address a little bit in the article. Why do we study slavery in the way that we do? How do we approach subjectivity in this moment? How do we approach the idea of black life and the idea of black humanity in this moment? And a lot of that is tethered to a very 20th century black liberatory politics that studying and engaging slavery in a particular way should get us somewhere. And it hasn't gotten us to this place that we're thinking <laughs> of all, in right. terms of that liberatory where we're still in 2015 having to affirm that black lives matter. So when you are doing that and then within that having to say that black trans lives matter, that we have to get very specific in terms of articulating black humanity. So the recovery of something of a period through a sensory lens, through an affective approach to begin to do that kind of work and that kind of labor around us, I think offers an opportunity to imagine eroticism doing something other than just simply thinking about this kind of the mundaneness of pleasure but it's also about the mundaneness of sex, sex right, right. Yeah. and and that these things are not only happening i mean i found that moment so powerful in the film because it is this moment of connection it is this moment of humanness there yeah. is wetness there is feeling there mm -hmm. is titillation there is it's a tense moment. It's not fully pleasurable. It, it's exacted in that. And there's something about that in which we see the enslaved body in particular ways that we are willing to imagine terror. We're willing to imagine subjection. We're willing to imagine dispossession. And for me, that humanizing project, and I think for us, a lot of it, that the fact that we have to do a humanizing project means recuperating and recovering these moments, these these ellipses in this of joy and desire, even if only ephemeral yeah. moments. And that this is a way in which enslaved subjects and enslaved bodies could still exact a feeling of realness. Yeah. It also means that we can kind of get into the way that slavery um, 
it comes out of these big pictures of oh it's yes. bondage or it's chattel or people are property and that you know those are huge abstract concepts in a lot yeah, of ways yeah, yeah. Um, that carry a lot of weight and carry a lot of power but we also forget that slavery that bondage itself is built up um, the violence of dispossession the fungibility of blackness these are built up in intimate ways and like t tiny small ways so the denial of pleasure or the claiming of it and be end up becoming these battlegrounds and um, somebody camp was very good at that yes. at, at bringing out these ways that um, both slavery and resistance are built in the everyday moments, um, in the struggles over space, in posters on a wall, and for, yeah. I think one of the things we wanted to bring out in this, in this article is to think about what are the ways that either the denial or the claiming of um, intimate pleasure is also part of um, the practice of slavery, the practice of bondage, but also a kind of practice of resistance, that, that we come back to the fundamental elements of what bondage is, what chattel slavery is, when we come back to these kind of small, small moments that come between bodies, like actual touching bodies. You're watching Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined today by professors Jessica Marie Johnson and Troop of Lane Lindsay, the author of a new essay, Searching for Con Climax, Black Erotic Lives and Slavery and Freedom. Um, both of you have been very active and committed to what we might define now as the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, Professor Johnson, you know, you helped a group of faculty come together to write a letter in support of, of students around the country, right, who, who are dealing with these issues, not only just in the classroom, but, you know, when they leave the classroom, walking on campus, when they walk off campus and, and into a real world, right, you know, they're reminded of everything that's going on. You know, how has this moment for you felt different than other moments? I mean, we're talking two, three years after Trayvon Martin. You know, it's almost a decade since uh, Gina Six. Right. Um, right. You know, what is so different about this moment? Um, so, yeah, thank you for that. Because, um, so Ray Paris wrote the letter. It's a beautiful letter, um, colleague at um, MSU in, um, in English and Creative Writing. Uh, and, yeah, this is a different... This is a different type of moment, and it's something that I'm still sort of trying to wrap my mind around, so yeah. I'd be interested in what Dr. Lindsay also has to say. I think it's a combination of um, kind of tools that are available uh, for activists. I think the digital space and social media plays a lot of, uh, plays a major role in publicizing um, and in spreading awareness, but also in organizing action yeah. and organizing yeah. um, marches and walks, but also everyday actions that are happening, like even the a couple days ago in St. Louis, actions are happening at malls, at airports, things like that. Um, I think that plays a huge role. I think that it's also a moment where um, there's an interesting tension between people who've been engaging in conversations about black trans lives matter, black trans lives mattering, or black queer lives mattering, or black women's lives mattering, um, and a kind of um, grassroots and indigenous activism that's happening for some time that is having a moment to um, to flower and get tapped into. I think St. Louis is a particular place yeah, that has yeah, had, um, yeah. I think Detroit is similar. I was talking yeah, about yes. New Orleans with someone um, recently also, is that there is- Baltimore. Baltimore, right. There are these places <laughs> right. that are these hot spots Oakland. of activists. <laughs> yeah, oh, yes. <laughs> of organ and peace, yes. Oakland. <laughs> of organizing activity. Um, and that this became, uh, and, so there's that. So. Uh, uh, underneath the kind of social media, the social networking and the networks that have been created on online. Um, but it's also it's also a moment where this keeps happening. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like four happened in a row. It was like Izzel Ford, Ahmaud Bennett, um, Mike Brown, um, and there was there's another name that I'm going to I'm going to forget. Um, I'm going to blank on. Uh, but it just it happened so quickly yeah. and uh, it, it just sort of floored everyone, and Ferguson is a particular place. Like yes. even just being there, it's a particular space where um, uh, the residents there, the neighborhood itself, wasn't standing for it. Um, so it's it's interesting. Like I, like I said, like I'm clearly still processing why this particular moment, what makes this possible, and what makes yes. it happen now. Um, I'm sure that there are elements of where there are people who are placed in. Um, in certain positions, even in their own lives. I think there's a cadre of folks who have come into the academy with particular ideas about social justice, mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. the environment, mm -hmm. about the prison mm -hmm. industrial complex, about making change that have also been very vocal. Same thing with um, media and journalism. 
Um, so it's 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 an interesting convergence of a lot of a lot of different things that I think um, have come into play. I will say a lot of that that at the end of the day, it comes down to the activists on the ground, particularly in Ferguson, who have publicized yeah. it yes. and who have been vocal about it, and who are still there and who right. are still tweeting about it and still having action on the ground. So not just you know online things, although online activism is very important. Um, that that if it were not for that visibility, that we would not it would be a non-issue, and I think it's really important. To when the idea of Black Lives Matter began to circulate very widely, um, you know, there was this immediate, not quite a pushback, right, but this idea, almost a corrective in some folks' minds, that did all lives matter. <laughs> and, and, and so, yeah, I want you to unpack that discussion. But, <laughs> but even within the discussion about Black Lives Matter, right, there's also the discussion about which Black, black lives, lives Matter, matter right? Right. So within this, I mean, at first, I want to identify Alicia, Opal, and Patrice for being the individuals, right. three queer women, queer women of color, who started the Black Lives Matter hashtag right. and really been at the forefront of creating a movement base. This is happening in this post Trayvon moment, actually, right. that it's right. galvanized and then being part of that. So, and them having to write a history of the hashtag yeah, and the right. movement, even right. as it's happening. And we see this, this recurring theme in history in which in many ways women, queer people, gender non-conforming people are often written out our histories of activism. And the technology is important in that regard right. because now they, they can immediately offer those Respond corrective in ways that say Ella Baker couldn't right. 50 years ago. And I think that's really important in terms of both framing who's doing the activism and what bodies we're choosing to rally right. around and what bodies we're choosing to galvanize around. And you see this quite often in the framing of we have the Malcolm X grassroots movement report which says, you know, one black person every 28 yeah, hours was killed in 2012 is 313 people. And then you'll see retweets will say one every 28 hours a black man is killed. And it's almost like, wow, this this conflation of the two and this idea that we have really galvanized around black mm -hmm. men and boys and black women, black queer people, black trans people have been on the front lines of activism around that. But when we see nine trans women of color between June and October being murdered, and we don't have that same kind right. of conversation. And very little three, coverage, right? right? Very little coverage and in mainstream three that black press. murdered in the past two weeks. Right. Um, and and right. it's a misidentification. Just started. In three weeks in, we've already had three right. um, trans women who've been murdered. So I, I think there's something to think about there. And when you get to the all lives versus black lives and then black lives, which black lives we're talking about, we still are saying, and I think this is part of our work, um, that's even in the article that we're here for is this idea that black lives have not mattered mm. and the full proclamation the the framing of all lives and saying certain lives have always mattered right. Right. and there is a way in which saying black lives matter is not a proclamation of saying that we're trying to convince you that they do but the affirmation of when we are subjected to the kinds of racial terror mm. that we've been subjected to we have to proclaim affirm organize, mobilize around that idea to remind ourselves as we are under constant and daily threat and messages that we don't. The late scholar Amy Ellis referred to kind of three distinct periods of racial terror in our nation's history, right? Antebellum slavery around um, particularly anti-black uh, racial violence, antebellum slavery, Jim Crow, and then the prison industrial mm -hmm. complex as these three distinct ways. And he's thinking through this through the lens of black mm -hmm. masculinities. And I would add that what is unique about this moment is I think we're in a new moment of racial terror. And I think it's decidedly around how this prison industrial complex is manifested in the actual policing and surveillance of black bodies, that we're in a new era of surveillance and state sanctioned violence, which speaks to health, which speaks to the reasons in which we don't identify trans bodies within this space, the misidentification that's happening, mm -hmm. the reality mm -hmm. that these reports, when we're saying one every 28 hours, when we compare that to numbers around lynching, are eerily similar. That there is a new process in this moment of hyper raciality mm -hmm. that we are feeling the brunt of our nation's founding around racial terror being manifested in the 21st century. So understanding our nation as one founded on racial terror, that yeah, that is a right. founding principle right. of our nation that has to find new ways and new vehicles through which to express itself. And I think in this, we see state and state section violence being part of that. So the claiming of Black Lives Matter really is in response to this latest iteration of anti-Black racial terror. And the mobilization that's happening is decidedly rejecting the idea that we have to claim that anyone else matters in this moment beyond these black lives that we're seeing 
that are being constantly violated, victimized, and marginalized, disenfranchised, and dispossessed. It also asks us to kind of push against who ends up being qualified as black. I mean, that was one of the other yes. interesting things that came up when we were writing the piece is that um, there are many ways that sort of the iconic slave is still a black man, um, not even a young man necessarily, but a black man yes. figure who could who is our image of a laborer, um, which is not necessarily the iconic slave <laughs> at uh, all Solomon across Northrop, the time and space. Right. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, Solomon Northrop would be a perfect example. This is right. an iconic slave. But that becomes a way that we understand a kind of iconic blackness too, at mm -hmm. least in the U.S. Mm -hmm. context of, mm -hmm. of what black identity is and what black community is. So that when we think about, okay, Black Lives Mattering, our, the image that still pops up in many people's heads is a black man, maybe an older, you know, an older youth, 18 years old, I think is still a child, but somebody 18 yes. to 30 or 30, 35, 18 to 40. Um, when in reality, if we if we have this conversation, not only with um, systems of terror, but also amongst ourselves about who actually is part of this community, begin to rethink that, um, we, A, have to rethink how we understand slavery, because that is still the kind of um, yes. Root and fundamentals of yes. uh, the logic of how mm -hmm. we understand what U.S. blackness is, um, but we also then have to rethink, you know, who gets included when we're protecting people, um, who gets included when we defend people, and when we fight back, and who gets, you know, for example, to be a hashtag. Um, as um, somebody was tweeting out um, earlier today, um, I'm going to forget one of the activists who I think is with um, Trans Women of Color Ohio, um, that you know, like we have not rallied around the three no. um, trans. Uh, people of color who have been shot, who have been killed. I don't right. know if they've all been shot, who have right. been killed since January started, since 2015 started. Um, but we do it so readily when it's a certain kind of figure. And I think right. that, that's also something that can be pieced out and brought back in time and space um, and have a conversation. And it's about. interesting because I think we, we seen, saw a minor shift, uh, you know, in the way that the Mike Browns and the Trayvon Martins are idealized victims, right? Young, who have all this potential and possibility. Um, that's not how we might read Eric Garner. Right. And Eric Garner seemed like a very interesting choice to rally around because he was not the kind of quintessential victim, right? He's an older man, um, not, you know, I, I won't call him in the kind of Pookie and Nene class, but, you know, as folks make particular decisions about who we're going to rally around, right. the black community has been very hesitant to rally around Pookie and Nene, yes. right? <laughs> right, as opposed yes. to Trevor and, and yes. someone like yes. that. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. No, and I think with the Eric Garner, what we saw, one, is this recurrence for this generation, and I think it is what we saw, of course, with the L.A. uprising over 20 mm -hmm. years ago. We had a certain way, right? We have the tape. We have the video. We have this interaction that seems so familiar. We're in the middle of cases talking about stop and frisk, frisk right. and broken window policing and the ways in which black and brown bodies in this instance mm -hmm. are so heavily policed and guarded around this and you know we did then start to create the narrative around right he's the father of these children and you see his yes, um right. his wife and his family right. like the certain ways like don't you can keep your apology like nothing's gonna bring i have a family to support right. you know when yeah. his yeah. wife is responding to what's happened to him and the marching that happens around him and a following of course after that you have a kai girly in new york as well yeah. that there is these very localized experiences with police. We have NYPD means a particular kind of thing. Oakland PD means a particular kind of thing. LAPD PD means a particular right. kind right. of thing. We now know Ferguson PD means a particular yeah. kind of yeah. thing. And so we see these particularities that are happening, but we're then starting to make certain kinds of connections yeah. that are happening around what policing looks like. What are the contours of the community that then make this possible? What are the contours of Ferguson that make the particular history of St. Louis County? Why? Not just that there's this uprising, but this kind of ability to sustain a kind of energy. This is the most sustained movement we've seen. In some time. Yeah. In some considerable yeah. amount of time. Yeah. I mean, very sustained online, in presence, in movements. Yeah. I mean, Hands Up United, OBS, um, the Lost Voices. Um, it, it, it's all Millennial of these people, Melinda like you, you see this and they're moving through space and time in particular kinds of ways and connecting and even traveling as far as to Palestine to make right, certain to make kinds of connections, connections that we're starting to see a global movement. And I just want to remind folks in this moment, this is a nascent movement, which I think is why we're still trying to find mm -hmm. the Forgot, language Forgot around what it is. We're yeah. in it and right. you, you don't know that it's a thing. Well, it's, you know it's a something, you know the energy, you know work is being done. So what people are asking, what are the goals? What are the, this, is like, this is so early. 
people right. and what this is. And these people are on fire, but they're already making connections to Palestine. They're making con connections to other anti-colonial struggles. They're making connections. And there's, I think, a group of young people within this movement who are asking the questions about gender and sexuality immediately that haven't been asked in prior ways course, that have been absolutely. things that we recuperate and talk about as historians to say, these are people that mattered in this moment. And they're saying, no, we're gonna do this right now. We're gonna push you. We're gonna challenge this very uh, black heteropatriarchal model of leadership. We're going to challenge this and we're gonna challenge who you think about as the victim so that we can say Ayanna Jones, that we can say it's Lynn Nettles, that we can say Diamond Williams, that we can Marissa say Alexander, Marissa Alexander, the, Alexander the judicial system, and, the 30, right. and you know, have these names and have these people, you have the word Dr. Uh, I think it was Kalila Brown Dean who did the map of the right. US with all names of black women and girls who had been murdered. And when we think about the spectrum of people who have, the youngest being Ayanna Jones, right, who was seven, all of his being pearly golden at 92. So the anchoring of how we think about recent anti-black racial violence is still anchored by a black girl and a black woman in terms of victimhood. And I think we have to be very deliberate in demanding that and continuing to demand that and asking people why we don't include, what are we still grappling through even within our movement? But I think those questions are being raised in the moment, which is encouraging. Yeah. I mean, you have two of the, the primary activists with Millennial AU, Alexis and Brittany, got yes. married. <laughs> like they met in Ferguson right. and right. ended up getting married. So even in this, like you have these moments where, you know, both resistance and joy and and fun and pleasure and uh, a pleasurable intoxication of intoxication of enjoyment, like these things also matter. Um, and their determination to both make that, um, share it with us, to make it public and through social media, um, yeah. to the extent that they did. Um, some of it was also BuzzFeed, just sort of, hey, snatch these. <laughs> so some of it was that. Thank you guys, though, for sharing what you had. Yes. Um, you know, like their, their willingness to do that. And also, it happened in a moment in which marriage equality is so fraught. And it happened in an extremely conservative state, in a conservative right. city in a lot of ways. And it happened during Black Lives Matter and Ferguson right. and all of the activism. Right. Like these things are intersecting in some really yes. interesting ways that we should not be able to later say, well, it only mattered that Mike Brown was yeah. shot. Right. Like that just right. seems, it's inaccurate. And it's, um, um, it's, it does a kind of violence to the history and to our future movement making, you know, and what we can do, you know, what the possibilities are in the future. You're watching Left of Black. We're joined here today by Professor Jessica Marie Johnson, who is a assistant professor of history at Michigan State University. We're also joined by Professor Treva Blaine Lindsay, who is a assistant professor of gender and women's studies at The Ohio State University. Uh, I'm going to change directions just a little bit. Um, you two are both black women historians. Give me your five books oh, okay. oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> that you think would be foundational reading um, as black women historians. Oh, goodness. I'm going to let her go first. She's, no! actively still, she's actively still in history. <laughs> I get to math with the historians every once in a while. Ugh, okay, I, I'm probably going to turn to what's on my desk. Um, I would, as, so, and they're going to be specific to my field. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're going to be my favorites. Um, uh, Stephanie Camp's Closer to Freedom, yes. I think, is on one of the high, high, high on the list, as mm -hmm. I've mentioned already. Um, it's, it's really important, I think, especially in this moment, but also in how we do histories of slavery. Um, to come back to the everydayness of the violence right. and the right. everydayness of resistance, um, uh, and for some people, it, it doesn't. It's it going as far as resistance is a problem. Then comes to the everydayness of pleasure, of joy, of dance, mm -hmm. of expressing life. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever way we want to describe it. And um, and Camp did that so well yes. and so um, uh, simply, but complexly. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful work of art um, that um, that everybody should read. Um, so that would be one. Um, I'd add um, Deborah Gray White's Our Tie Woman, still a classic. Um, it was described to me once as a book that um, both did the history, but yes. also spoke back to the issues of the time period, um, which I think is is something that, you know, I would love to do in my work, but I think it's, is, is a craft and is a skill that's, um, and an art and um, 
and it, so it's a beautiful work. It's also the book that um, that created the Female Slaves Library of Congress subject heading. Like before that, there was not actually a separate head, subject heading mm -hmm. for female slaves, which makes no sense at all. But um, <laughs> that book did it. That book forced the case, which also shows the way that um, that um, the, you know publications. Um, the creation of knowledge actually makes a fundamental difference in how that knowledge is then passed on and, and rearticulated as to. Um, Jennifer Morgan's Laboring Women, um, for what it does for diaspora, for what it does for thinking about reproduction, but also, because we've, we've thought about reproduction before, it's not, I mean, it's, you know, slavery follows the mother, like this is sort of fundamentals of slavery logics, but it also asks us to think about the symbolic role that reproductive bodies, um, black women yeah. reproductive um, labor does for slavery um, in some ways above and beyond just producing bodies like what is the work that it does for law what does it do for how people think about sexuality what does it do for how people think about what is a slave what is not who is protected um, etc um i would add what is on my desk i would add um Christina Sharp's Monstrous Intimacies. Yes. Um, I'm obsessed with the book. I'm obsessed with her work. <laughs> I just think it's really sort of asking us to ask hard questions about yeah. um, the same thing, like where is the work of slavery happening? We find it, um, Every Kitchen is a Bravo is one of the, the key chapters, I think, um, in, or one of the key ideas that she brings out of, particularly Frederick Douglass's um, Douglas's essays um, of the time period um, in thinking about how s the violence of slavery, like where you actually see it and feel it and hear it, you know, like where is it, where is it felt? Um, and so I think that um, it, Christina does a beautiful, beautiful job of bringing things, um, not just out uh, into, out of the archive of slavery at the moment, but also across time and space. Yeah. Um, Sergey Bartman, Kara Walker, um, Carissa Dora, a whole uh, series of texts that are important for how we understand um, bondage um, are interrogated. And so it's a beautiful work. Okay, so I, I all of those are beautiful. I'm like, oh, I want to change my list. This feels like top five, right? The, the Chris Rock movie and kind of doing this with hip hop albums, which I'm usually right. asked to do more often in my five artists. Um, I, I'm going to do kind of a little more primary sourcey. I think I'm going to okay. say Anna Julia Cooper's uh, Voice from the South. Yeah, um, yeah. I think it's foundational. Yes. I think it's important in terms of how we continue to interrogate our thinkers, our black intellectual mm -hmm, histories mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, what that work mm -hmm. does and the recuperation of that work alongside and for many ways for me that are kind of very Du Bois centric yeah. way of thinking about African American history and African American intellectual production. I think there's a lot we miss when we don't start with her right, in terms right, of thinking through right, right. that period. Um, and it's certainly as a feminist, black feminist historical text, I think yeah. we study that. I would add in there Southern Whores, uh, mm -hmm. Ida B. Wells, I think it's very timely in this moment to begin mm -hmm. thinking about what racial terror looks like and the fact that a black woman's voice and pen is bringing that to bear in particular kinds of ways. Um, I think that that's really important. Uh, I do uh, Robert Ransby, Michael Baker. <laughs> yes. I, I mean, yes. it's just a so ridiculous ridiculously comprehensive and yes, amazing yes. and a scholar who I think continues to be in conversation with us in very real ways about how we think about um, civil rights movement, black freedom struggle, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that paves the way for the kind of work that you saw with like Daniel McGuire and at the dark end of the street right. and thinking about that. Um, for a classic like kind of basic sense of the field, I think when and where I enter is still yes. Uh, yes. extraordinarily important. In fact, a line from it was one of the lines we thought of about quite um, intensely as we wrote our piece on searching for climax. And I think it really is framed through the lenses of race and sex. And my last one is, I think, one that has really helped me think through some of this kind of interiority in black beauty politics would be Tiffany Gill's work on uh, beauty shop politics. And thinking through this increasing body of work that I see emergent that's really coming out of this space of uncovering the spaces that black women have created uniquely yeah. Yeah. to engage and to force a certain kind of conversation. So I think mine is in terms of scope, obviously I wanna have that foundational, but what are these new directions? What are these questions? Monstrous intimacies, I think is great mm -hmm. that Stephanie Camp's work. Um, is doing that. I, I think there's a lot of work that's about to come out and hit that's going to do that uh, and push our boundaries and how we think about history and how we look at the archive. 
You've been watching The Left of Black. We've been joined today by Professor Trooper Blaine Lindsay of The Ohio State University and also Professor Jessica Marie Johnson of Michigan State University. Thank you both for joining us in the Left of Black studio. Thank you. Thank you. Black lights and booze burn when I record for Watts and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything.